everyone. Um, before we pray, um, if you could turn in our Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. And I'll be reading from verse 16. found in our Bible, John 3, 16. Um, we probably don't need to read verse 16. We can say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whomsoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Um, we generally don't continue to read, which I'm going to do right now. Verse 17 says, For God sent not his son, into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. Verse 19, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Verse 20, for everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Verse 21, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, your forgiveness, your power. We thank you for all that you are doing, and we thank you for what you're about to do in our lives. Spirit of the living God, continue to fall afresh on us. These things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Excellent. Are we, we good to go? What's his name? Tony. Could you press the button for me? Thank you. Standing in God's love is what we're looking at today. Um, go ahead, Tony. All right, uh, a worldview. Uh, how many of you understand the word worldview is a set of beliefs about the most important issues in life? In other words, the key values that you have today are based on these factors your upbringing your school your culture your parents or your church so for example many of us here are seventh day adventists what day of the week do seventh day adventists worship on saturday sabbath let's break that down a little bit more is it a saturday sunset friday to sunset sabbath now if I was to ask you, why do you worship on the Sabbath? Why do you see the seventh day as the Lord's rest? What would you say to me? Because God blessed and hallowed it. Where did you get that from? Okay. So anyone else? Why worship on the Sabbath? Because God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Anyone else? It's the way you grew up. I'm going to argue today that the majority of us, and these texts are very correct, but the majority of us worship on the Sabbath because we were told to. We grew up that way. We always went to church on the Sabbath. So for me, it just, the Bible just ties in with my worldview. Next slide, please, Tony. Is it Tony? Tony, okay. A, a maturing process is simply this. Now, this also plays a part in your worldview. 
Um, the picture here shows when you have a darling little girl, you put them in those Cinderella dresses. They look cute, they look pretty, but as they grow up, they don't want to wear those dresses anymore. They don't want to do their hair like that anymore. They don't like the ponytails. They want to do their own thing. This young man here, I, I, I pick on him a lot. Give me your name, sir. Jordan, Jordan. Powerful name. Jordan, how old are you, Jordan? 10. 10. And Benjamin, you're nine. You're nine, you're 10 in a few weeks. Right, these guys, everything that they know that they believe, the majority of it comes from their parents comes from their parents' denomination, their parents' church. As they grow older, so for me, as I got into college, as I explained uh, a few days ago, that as I got to college, I began to see that my friends were wearing a certain brand of clothing. So that the in trainers and those days were Nike Air. Do you know what Nike is? Nike Air, right. But when I came to college, I was wearing Crocs. So automatically, where when I was 10 and 11, I used to love Crocs. But when I came to college, I don't want Crocs no more. I want to wear what? Nike, because everybody else is wearing Nike. So automatically, my mindset begins to change. I'm like, I don't want to wear these trainers no more. I want to wear what everybody else is wearing. For the girls, I don't want to wear this dress anymore. I want to wear what my girlfriend's wearing. I don't want to be on the bus anymore, my friends are driving, I want to drive. As we begin to grow and mature, our maturity process, including our worldview, begins to change. A popular one of this is sex. Many of us have no issue with sex growing up. In fact, AJ and Christian, my two sons, who you will see on Friday, whenever I kiss Caroline, they go, oh, mommy kiss daddy. If they see anyone kiss on TV, oh, uh, they're kissing. Now, when they're 16, their mindset, their worldview begins to change. But this is the problem. Next slide, Tony. Our worldview of God, our worldview of church, our worldview of religion, I'm going to argue today, for some of us, has not changed. See, some of us, sexually, we've upgraded. Where, where we can talk about sex like nobody's business. Where, where, where we're proud to get naked in front of somebody else. Where we're happy to sit, to kiss and to touch. There's no issues with that. I can go into a shop and buy alcohol or smoke weed. I can do this stuff and I can be brave. I'm not that shy boy, Jordan. I'm not Jordan anymore. I'm a grown man. Even though I'm 16, I'm a grown man. I think I can do anything I want. I can think big. I can talk big. I can watch what I want. I'm not 18 yet, but I'll still watch an 18 movie. We always try and get ahead of ourselves when it comes to the things of the world. But when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to our view on God, many of us are like this. Go ahead, Tony. One more time. We're adults, but have a mindset of God like babies. In other words, my view of God is based on what I was taught in school at church, but I've never actually upgraded my spirituality to be convicted, so I'm growing with God. No, my reason for church is simply based on my childhood. And now that I'm a man, I don't really understand why I go church on Sabbath. All I know is it's the right thing to do. I don't actually know why I have to dress this way, or why I have to eat this, or why I can't go here, or why I can't see this. All I know is when I was growing up, you can't do this, you can't sit there, you can't be there. So for me, my religion is my childhood. I haven't actually matured as I've grown as an adult. Next slide, please. So people of ages of, people of all ages were asked two questions. Next slide, please. Keep going. One more time. What comes to mind when you think of God? And what comes to mind when you think of Jesus? What comes to your mind when you think of God? And what comes to your mind when you think of Jesus? The answers were phenomenal. But to break this thing down, people generally saw God as a distant being far away. I don't really know God, but when it came to Jesus, Jesus' love, 
Jesus is mercy. Jesus is the best, my best friend. Jesus is this. But when it came to God the Father, I, I don't really know. So these are some of the images that came up with God. Go on, Tony. This is how many of us perceive God. This is based on society. This is based on our perception of the song, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Because the Father up above, looking down, and even though we say tender love, the perception is, if I make a mistake, God's going to look at me. We have this perception of God as looking down, as if you make a mistake, he ain't happy. But then when it comes to Jesus, next slide, Tony. Jesus is my homeboy. Jesus is my best friend. I can be a sinner in front of Jesus because you know what? He's forgiveness. He's mercy. He's grace. He's all of those nice things. But God, whoa, thank God for Jesus because I don't know how I do with God. Next slide for you, Tony. The problem with this is this. Based upon my findings and my own personal experience. Next slide. Keep going. We'll stop right there. Many of us follow, worship, and pray to the wrong God. I want us to be clear on this, that many of us, not all of us, but many of us, as we have yet to know the God of the Bible. When I speak to people who are close to me back in London, if I ask them, why don't you go to church anymore? They say, well, <laughs> when I go to church, if I don't look right, then people judge me. And when people judge me, I feel, I feel like I'm being, I'm being um, victimized. So I don't want to go to a church like that. And if I go to a church and I'm being victimized, by definition, if your church victimizes people and points at people, and every time they make a mistake, they get punished and banished, and this fellowship, then your God must also be like that. Your God is like that too. So you know what? Keep your God and keep your church. And then the result is that many people don't believe in God because the God that they were exposed to didn't show love, didn't show mercy, was not kind, was not patient, but always getting on my back. You can't do this. You have to do this. You have to do this. So all of a sudden, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. But what I'm realizing is that, yeah, I can agree with you because if I knew that God, I would be an atheist too because I don't believe in that God. I believe in the God of the Bible. But if you have not grown in your spiritual walk, if when Benjamin, Benjamin, if, if your perception of God always remains the same image as your parents, then you will never unlock who God is for you. You have to, on some level, take it personal. You have to. You cannot live of your parents' experience. You cannot live of your church experience. You cannot live of your college experience. You cannot live of my experience because it's mine, you can't have it. You have to have your own. Next slide. Now, Tony, take your time on this. Take your time on this. Let's follow my lead on this, Tom. This is Kimberly. Kimberly's an average church goer. She's like the, the majority of young people. Come home, yeah, mom, how are you doing? School was okay, that was it, that's it, no, that's it. No discussion, no conversation. She goes to her room, she's on her mobile, da 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 da, -da WhatsApp, Twitter, whatever they do. But then all of a sudden, Kimberly got to college and met this Islam group. She's a Seventh-day Adventist. But this Islam group took her in. One year later, this is Kimberly. Go ahead, Tony. This is Kimberly. Stop right there. Stop right there. Kimberly says, Mom, I'm not being an Adventist no more. I'm joining the religion of Islam. How does the church respond? When the church hear about this, <laughs> the church hear about this, well, there's an emergency board meeting. We have to call the leaders together to discuss this young person who should know better. And the natural result is this young lady, Kimberly, needs to be disfellowshipped from the church. This is her perception of church. Next, next slide, please, Tony. This is Kyle, part finder, a preacher of the word. He joins college. He gets caught up in the, the peer pressure of life. This is Kyle now. He puts his picture on Facebook. 
The eldest daughter sees his picture, says, Dad, Dad, look at this picture. The eldest sees the picture. One more, once again. Huh? <gasps> Tattoos on his chest? What does the church do? Well, you know, as a church, we don't believe in this kind of thing. As a church, we don't endorse this kind of thing. You are also needed to be this fellowship. Then you have the elder of the church. Good old Elder Jenkins. The million dollar smile. But his marriage is breaking up. And his wife comes and says, listen folks, the reason why I'm divorcing this guy, because he's addicted to, one more time, pornography. <gasps> the elder of the church? How do we respond? How do we deal with this? Well, just to let you know, Elder Jenkins, you can no longer serve as an elder. You have to sit in the ranks, maybe this fellowship. Maybe he you knows the pastor, he's hooked up with the pastor, so he won't get this fellowship, he'll get censored for like two months. But the point is there's, there's discipline, there's response, there's this, there's that, there's this. Now, this is the problem if this is your view of God. If you believe that when you make a mistake that God doesn't like you anymore, then this is what you will grow up to do. You will begin and learn to hide your sins. You will actually be taught how to wear a mask to church because you cannot be yourself because you're scared that somebody will see you and judge you and kick you out. So what you then do is you pretend to be someone else. So I come to church and I'm, hey, how are you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. <laughs> hey, God is so good. Hey, and I sit down and I'm, I'm, I, I don't really want to sing. I don't really want to do anything. But when people come up to me, how are you doing? Oh, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm, I'm blessed. And I just leave. And you never see me again until the next Sabbath and I do the same thing over and over again. But what you don't know is that I'm suicidal inside. What you don't know is I'm addicted to drugs. What you don't know is I have a lost issue. What you don't know, my home is broken. But I would never tell you this because when I see someone else mess up, I saw how they were treated. So because I saw this, I will not show you who I am. And because you're the church, you should be God's people. If you're like this, God must be like this too. So you go around with all these fake people. And some of us have had enough of being fake. To the point now, we come to church and we don't smile. I don't care if I don't sing. I don't care about this. We come to church and we do what we want to do. Because this generation, our generation, oh, we, we, don't, we don't play fake. If we believe something, we're going to say it. If the pastor says something, we don't understand it, we're going to Google that thing. Not like the good old days when the pastor said, come to church, and our parents' parents said, okay, you're the pastor. No, no, this generation, I ain't coming because you said to come. Because I'm my own individual. Next slide, please. Wait one there, wait, 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 wait right there. This is Billy. He belonged to a Christian family who did their best to raise him up in the way he should go in the sight of the Lord. One evening, when at the age of 15, Billy's parents left him at home to study his GCSEs. Whilst they went to prayer meeting, good old Christians. They came back early from prayer meeting and they came home to see Billy like this. One more time, that's once. Billy was a cross-dresser. Now, what would your response be if you came home to a scene like that? Think about it for a moment. <clears throat> Billy's father's response was this. Next slide. His parents were shocked and disgusted by his behavior, and they told him that God was equally revolted. When they discovered that he had been cross-dressing for some time, occasionally with another boy, they said, unless he immediately, immediately, and permanently changes, he was no longer welcome in their family. And they also assured him that God would damn him to eternity in hell. So they said to him, it, would, it shouldn't be surprising to you to discover that as Billy got older, 
his view of God was pretty similar to that of his parents. So, so we're in a culture now where if I, if I make a mistake, I don't run to God for forgiveness. I don't run to God for power. I don't run for God for liberation. I don't stand for him. No, what I do is I run away. Because God don't like sinners. God only likes perfect folk. And I don't want to pick on the theologians, but sometimes the perception is God only likes theologians. Those who have dedicated their, their life to the ministry. Us folk, us other folk, oh man, we're the, we're the standard normal folk. It's us folk that, that da, 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 da. but I can tell you this, that even in the theology department, even in the church, even with the professed, those who profess to be righteous and holy, every single one of us are struggling with something. All of us are. The question is, we understand how dad responds. Some of us understand how our church would have responded because you're coming from different places. But the real question is, listen to me now, the issue isn't so much how does Pastor Fuller respond or how does Pastor Johnson respond. That's irrelevant because Pastor Fuller or Pastor Johnson cannot save you. The issue should not be how does Alice of the Chaplain respond. The issue shouldn't even be how does your parents respond. The fundamental issue should be how does God respond. How does God respond? Tony? The characters of God the Father. Luke 15, 1 to 32. Let's go. One more time. One more time. The Pharisees are, are upset with God because God is hanging. They're upset with Jesus because Jesus is hanging around with sinners. If you read John 15, chapter 1, the first verse is this. The Pharisees are murmuring because Jesus is hanging with sinners. So Jesus, in response to the murmuring, with him hanging with sinners, he tells three parables. The first parable is this. There's a shepherd who has 99, no, no, back up, back up, thank you. The first, the first, the first, the first parable is this. There's a shepherd who has 100 sheep. But when one is missing, what does the shepherd do? He goes to find him. He goes to find him. Now, many of us have belonged to a church where when we're missing, nobody calls us. Hello, somebody. When we're not in action, nobody's checking to see what we're doing. That's how people may act, but that's not how God acts. When someone is missing, he goes to find you because he loves you too much. The second example is the, the lost coin. There's a coin that's lost in this room in the house. So he knows that the coin has to be in the house. And the woman does not stop searching until what? Until she finds it. Now in both these illustrations, how does the shepherd and the woman respond when the, the coin and the sheep is found? Very happy that the Bible says there's rejoicing because somebody was lost, but now they're found. The house example is this. Some of us are in the church, we're elders, we're deacons, we're, we're youth leaders, etc. And even though we're in the church, we're still lost. We're lost in the church. And Jesus is saying, even people like us who think we're saved, the spirit is still searching for us to be found. That's the power of the house. And then you have the story of the prodigal son. And the story of the son that was left behind. I haven't got time to talk about this now, but both sons were lost. Both of them were lost. Next slide, please. When Jesus told the story of the prodigal son, it was to remind us that far from focusing on our sins, God sees us through eyes of love. Why do we stay away from God so long when he is just waiting with open arms to receive us just as we are? Just as the prodigal son came to his senses, confessed his sins, and came as he was to his father, so we must come to our senses, confess our sins, and come to our father through Jesus Christ. This is the issue. The son did not say, let me get the money first before I go back. He did not say, let me get a trim and wash the dirt off me before I go back. No. All the son had to say was this, I stand. I'm going back. And the father took him just as he was. And there was rejoicing in heaven. Now, 
The next slide, please. Um, Tom? Tony. I had to say Tony. <laughs> this is the issue. Love as judge. See, some of us have this perception. Like your poem. Like the play. Like the picture. When we think of love, love is always something that makes us happy. So we, make, we, we sin, and then Jesus comes and says, don't worry, I'll forgive you. You have another chance. We see love as, if you love me, you will do nice things to me. If you love me, you will bless me. If you love me, that boyfriend, relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend, don't just say you love me. If you love me, take me out. If you love me, clean the house. If you, we have a perception that love has to do with me. Parents, parents, parents. Pastor, the parent? Who's the parents there? Raise your hand, parents. Who, who has children? Okay, hands down. Parents will back me on this. Parents will back me on this. That if I have a child, like my two sons, AJ and Christian, if I allow them to do Judith, to do everything that they want, take what they want, cry when they want, wear what they want, be what they want, even though I know it's not for their good, am I a loving parent? Because God chastises those who he loves. He puts boundaries in place. Son, I know you see the fire. To age and Christian, ooh, blue and yellow and green and orange, ooh, I have to touch it. That's what my son wants to do. But I'm his parent. I know through experience if he touches the fire, he's going to burn. So I have to say to him, no. Daddy, can I have ice cream for breakfast? Daddy, can I have chocolate? My sons will eat sweets and I, that, there's rice, there's broccoli, there's meat, there's this, all that stuff, and then I'm not hungry. So I say to him, do you feel like some chocolate right now? Yes, daddy. But if you feel like chocolate, you can eat your food. Because for my son, he does not understand life. He only understands what he wants to understand. So when I say to my son, you can't have this, what does my son do? Come on, talk the truth. He cries. Okay, maybe not some of your children. Maybe some of, some of your children were just a straight. But when, my, when I say to my son, no, no, he gets upset. AJ is getting to the age where it's not being upset no more. AJ, who is five, who's turning six in a few weeks. AJ now thinks he's grown. He actually thinks he, me and him can conversate now. This is the, the back chat age where, daddy, I don't want to do this. Oh, daddy, why can't I do it? Everything's a while. He's trying to reason with me. Because in his mind, he thinks he's right. But he doesn't see what I see. See, 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 Jesus is not just Jesus, or God is not just God by giving you all that you want. Because if God gave you all that you want, some of you would not even be here today. And this is the issue. Do we trust God enough that when he says no, it's not because he hates you, but it's because he loves you? Can we trust him enough that when he pauses and you can't feel his presence, it's not because he's left you, it's because he's trying your faith, because he's preparing you for something much bigger. Can you trust God when it makes no sense and you're going through the fire and you're crying out, you're praying and you're fasting and there's no response, but deep down you know that God is able. Can you trust him then? Or some of us have a, have a schoolboy version of God. A schoolgirl version of God. The God many of us serve, he's Father Christmas. I only pray when I want something. Mommy said no, they said no. God, God, I, I, I <laughs> this is a theologian prayer. The Lord, 
I saw this girl. Because some of us don't pray for everything, we just do what we want to do. But some of us who are spiritual, we feel guilty, we, we pray even though we know the answer already. Lord, is she the one? Is she the one? Amen. <laughs> Would you go out with me? We don't wait for God's response. We pray to make ourselves feel better, but we already know the answer. We already know what we're going to do. We just pray to us. We can say, yeah, I pray. So when, when the apostle says, have you prayed about this? Who told you to do this? God said. I prayed and he moved. But you don't even know what God sounds like. You only pray when you want stuff. You only pray when you're in trouble. Lord, I've got no money for new bold. Oh, can I to pray now? Lord, bless me. Oh, bless me. I'm going to fast tomorrow. But when you're in school and you're passing your classes and the relationship's working and everything's going fine, I don't know God. I don't, I don't do church because there's no reason to go to God because you see him as Father Christmas. December the 25th, once a year, done deal. Even in the capacity of judge, you can play now, Andres. Play, play for me now. When sin will finally be put to an end. Now, folks, I want us to get this. God loves everyone in this room. The issue is the sin. It's the sin. It's the pride. The selfishness. He can't work with that. The Bible says that our, our minds are enmity towards God. He, he can't do it. This is why he says, if any man comes after me, you have to let go of selfishness. You have to let go of pride. Because pride is something that does not go well with the Holy Spirit. It blocks me. I cannot get in because pride's in the way. And pride, all pride says is, it's all about me. I do what I want to do. I'll wear what I want to wear. I'll go where I want to go. And I go to church when I want to go to church. I'll pray to you when I want to pray to you. Because it's about me. God says, no, 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 no. I love you. And it's because I can see the potential in all of you. Is why I send my spirit. It's because I can see the power in all of you. It's why I send angels to protect you day after day, time after time. Even when things don't go well, I'm crying out, come to me. I will give you rest. But a day is coming when those who have rejected life in Christ, listen to me, will be destroyed. The prophet Isaiah calls this act. The second coming, God's strange act. Because he has to put sin to bed. Sin has to go. But if we are refusing to let go, then we have to go with the one who we've chosen. My favorite author puts it this way. To our merciful God, the act of punishment is a strange act. As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the dead of the wicked. The Lord is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in good and in truth, forgiven iniquity and transgression and sin, yet he will by no means clear the guilty. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not acquit the wicked. Our scripture reading says this, and this is the condemnation, that light came into the world and men love darkness. Rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Folks, 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 listen to me. Listen to me. Jesus is saying, I need someone to stand for me today. I need someone to stand for me today. Because light has come. And you see, the new Bodians, let me say this if you didn't understand it. You are blessed more than any other university and college because you have an opportunity to hear the word of God on a regular basis. 
You can't argue about church. If you live on a campus, it's a walking distance. And it's not just one church. You have senior church. Is it senior church? Or main church? Not senior church. Main, main church. You have, what's this church called? Contemporary church. You have jump church. You have so, what else is there? You have experience on Thursday, not Thursday, Tuesday. You have re reunite on Friday. You have so many activities during the week. The people that go to colleges and universities outside don't have as much light as you do here. But yet many of us are still refusing the light because we love darkness. We love to do it our way. It has to be my way or no way. A man went to the doctor to check his infected finger. Unfortunately, he had waited too long. It must be amputated, the doctor said. Oh no, argued the man. I don't want my finger to be cut off. How can I live without this finger? But you must or it will get worse, the doctor replied. No, it won't. And the man left. The condition worsened, and the man returned to the doctor. Now the gangrene had moved to his arm. We must amputate your arm, the doctor told him. No, never. How could I live without an arm? Responded the patient. But you must, or it will take your life, the doctor said. The man loathed to have his arm amputated and left only to the detriment of dying. So it is with our sins. So it is with our traces. You must be willing to let Jesus in to begin the change in you. He doesn't even say stop sinning. He just says, come unto me, all those who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will work in you to do to my God pleasure. I will do it for you. I will be your victory. I will be your strength. You will do this only by me, but they that wait on me, I will renew your strength. Fear do not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed because I am your God. I will help you. I will strengthen you. I will lift you with my right hand of righteousness. All you need to do is come as you are with a contrite spirit, opening your heart. Lord, I realize I cannot do this on my own. I'm in need of help. And the spirit begins to move. He begins to transform. He begins to change. He begins to liberate. He begins to empower. He begins to move and work miracles in your life. You must be willing to make that stand for him. God tells us that he takes no pleasure in the dead, the death of the wicked. But it's because of our hard-heartedness, our sin stays where it is. Somebody here today has been moved, not because of me, and not because of me, trust me on this, not because of me. Spirit was moving a long time ago. Whilst you was in your mother's wombs, he knew that on this day, this moment, you would be here in your chair. It's no coincidence. It's another opportunity to stand for him. It's your opportunity. It's your time to say, you know what? I've tried to stop. I've tried to get it right. I've tried to say sorry and all of that stuff and I realize that every time I try, it don't work. I've tried to fix my marriage. I've tried to pay my debts, but I keep spending again somewhere else. I've tried to stop. I've tried to be kind, but I'm always angry. I've tried, but today I realize that God loves me just as I am. And God wants to bring me to a place that I would never dream of, but you have to make the stand. And if you want to make that stand, if you want to make that stand, I want to stand with me right now, but not just stand with me. I want to come right here, come to me. Come right here. 
stand right here. I'm going to pray with you right now. Alistair, get your team. Just come. Just stand. On Christ alone. Can we do that, praise team? Have you got it like that? Are we flexible like that? Can we, can, we, can we move that way? On Christ alone, I don't know the words. We need the words. We don't need, we haven't got the words. Do we know on Christ alone? Okay, we know it. Okay, come on, come on, Thomas. Let's, Dr. Thomas, uh, Andreas. On Christ alone. Whilst we're singing this song, Andre, Alistair is going to be handing out some forms. Um, let's, take a, let's take a form. Let's take a card. Let's think about your decision. Think about your decisions. All right, what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to hum this thing. We're going to, we can hum it, right? You know, we know the tune. All right, let's, don't let me sing this by myself, folks. Who, who, can, who can start this for me? of God in helpless pain. Fullness of God in helpless This gift of love and righteousness. Of love and scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. Here in the death of Christ I live. Folks, you have this card in your hand. And there are three options. I don't want you to leave this room without ticking the box. Whether it be prayer. We'll pray for you before you leave. In fact, I'll stay behind. If you want me to pray, if you want to talk, then we'll pray. If it's I want to be baptized, then I'll add to that. I don't believe anyone should get baptized without Bible studies to know what you're getting baptized in. But baptism doesn't save you. It just tells the world that I declare to stand for Christ. The decision has already been made. You're already saved. And if you want to learn more and you want Bible studies, then tick the box. But I encourage every one of you to tick a box. Don't leave this room without making a stand for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God in heaven. For God so loved the world that you sent Jesus. Thank you. Jesus, you did it. You were victorious. You depended upon your father. And he moved in a mighty way. Now you're interceding on our behalf that we can have power through your Holy Spirit. But some of us here, we're struggling. Life is rough down here. You know this. We're struggling. It seems such an easy decision, but darkness is nice. Lord, Holy Spirit, do what you do best. Show us your way to salvation. 
Convict our hearts. Seal the decisions that have been made today. Wrap us in your robe of righteousness. Fill us with your power. Do for us, Lord, what we cannot do for ourselves. For those of us in the valley of decision, give us no peace. Continue to prick our consciences until we choose you as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For those of us who are walking in the walk, keep us faithful. Keep us pressing. Keep us pushing. Even up until death. Father God, do what needs to be done to save every single body in this room. Every single individual who has given, to their, heart, given their hearts to you through the, through the live stream. Move, Holy Spirit, move. Hear my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated.